Hello, friends. Craig Ballard, Locked On Blue Jays. Throwback Thursday. Now, the Jays do have a game this afternoon. We will get you set for that. But all kinds of Throwback Thursday stuff today for the Toronto Blue Jays. A look at some fun stats and fun players and stories in the history of your Toronto Blue Jays. You are Locked On Blue Jays, your daily Toronto Blue Jays podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am Craig Ballard. I am Locked On Blue Jays. I am thankful that you're spending part of your day with me talking Blue Jay baseball. Shout out to those of you who are with the likes, the comments, and the increased subscribers as well on our YouTube channel. Thank you for that. And if you're one of those that are making the Locked On podcast one of your daily podcast listens, I certainly want to thank you as well. Now, today's game... We do want to look at a few different things in the next few segments, but even though today's Blue Jays Royals tilt is an afternoon game, it's getaway day. So first pitch will be at 2 10 PM Eastern. So yes, I mean, I get that a lot of you will have already, by the time you, you take in today's podcast, the game might be in progress or, or done. But for those of you who do check out the podcast during the day, I still want to do a, the first segment as a game preview. I still want to get you set for Kevin Gosman versus Jordan Lyles. I, as I mentioned, it, it is getaway day that's for both teams. After this game, Kansas City on a plane to San Francisco to take on the Giants and your Toronto Blue Jays heading to L.A. to take on the Angels. Mike Trout, Shohei Otani, and the Angels will get you set for that series in tomorrow's episode. But as for today, 2.10 p.m. Uh, Eastern first pitch, Kevin Gosman, Jordan Lyles. Kevin Gosman, how good has he been? And I mean, as a side note, aren't we so fortunate that the Blue Jays landed Kevin Gosman when they did? This past offseason, the free agent contracts for pitchers, oh my God, astronomical, like just absolutely insane. Now go back and look at the landscape when Kevin Gosman became a Blue Jay the previous offseason. And while the price was right, thank goodness the Toronto Blue Jays landed Gosman when they did. So happy to have him as a Toronto Blue Jay. He, he's just been so darn good. I'm a big fan. Now it is, I mean, truth be told, it is worth mentioning that Kevin Gosman has less experience versus the Kansas City Royals than any other team in baseball. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. I don't think it'll be a detriment because Gosman is so veteran, but worth mentioning that in his career, class half empty, Kevin Gosman's thrown three and a third innings pitched at Kauffman Stadium. He was rocked. Five runs, nine hits, two walks, two strikeouts. But there's a very easy glass half full. There's a very, very easy positive spin on this. That was back in 2017. It was back in 2017 when he was a Baltimore Oriole. Would you believe we know Kevin Gosman's calling card? The 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 reason for the, the worth the price of admission is his split finger fastball. The Baltimore Orioles didn't even let him throw the split finger fastball. So whatever experience he had with Baltimore is nothing compared to the pitcher he is right now with your Toronto Blue for your Toronto Blue Jays. Last season, he did pitch against Kansas City. It was a 3-1 Blue Jay loss. Six innings pitched, uh, seven hits, two runs allowed, a two walk, six strikeouts. The only batter that did, you know, really well against them was Bobby Wood Jr., who did go one for three. Gosman struck him out, but that one hit was a home run. Now, we know that the one thing that does continue for Kevin Gosman in a Toronto Blue Jay uniform is the bad luck. The bad defense behind him, whether it's downright, flat out, bad defense or bad managerial strategy with where the uh, players are positioned. Either way, it's been a whole, it's been a combination of so many different things that have been really bad luck. The actual on paper results for Kevin Gosman are nowhere near, nowhere close, are not at all in line with how good he's actually been for the Toronto Blue Jays. We said, we, we, we mentioned earlier, and we know that his calling card is that splitter. That splitter is as good a pitch as there is in all of baseball. What's interesting is in that debut against St. Louis, he did go. He did get the a strikeout on a couple batters with the splitter, but he was going to his fastball as his strikeout pitch against St. Louis. That, that was very interesting for me to see. Again, veteran savvy, right from Kevin Gosman. The splitter is outstanding; it's top tier. But Kevin Gosman is not a one-trick pony. Going to be opposed by Jordan Lyles. Now, Jordan Lyles. This is his first season in Kansas City. He was twelve and eleven with a four point four two ERA last season for the Orioles. Now, this is his fifth ever start at at, at Kauffman Field. Throws a fastball and a sweeping curve to righties. Throws a fastball and more of a traditional curve to lefties. Now, the Blue Jays hit right-handed pitchers very well. They've hit Lyles in their career very well. Lyles last season versus the Blue Jays, 2-1. and one. That's good, yes, but 5.63 ERA in his career. 3-2, and two, not bad, but 6.25 career ERA versus the Toronto Blue Jays. Jays hit, Jays hit Lyles, and I expect a lot more of the same this afternoon, to be totally honest with you. 
uh, last or sorry in, in the season in his season opener it was the second game of the season for Kansas City they lost that game two nothing he wasn't bad at all Lyles went five and a third innings just five hits allowed wasn't bad at all now as, as much as I'm praising the Blue Jays uh, against righties as much as I'm optimistic that the Blue Jays will hit Jordan Lyles they have in the past I think they will again today it is worth mentioning that there are Blue Jays in this lineup that have struggled mightily against Jordan Lyles. Now, one of them is Kevin Biggio. I doubt that we'll see him in the lineup today. Biggio just two for seven in his career against Lyles. Varsho one for seven. Oh, boy. Bo one for 11. My goodness. And Bo is going to hit second. Springer is going to hit first. Well, George Springer two for 17 career against Jordan Lyle. So there's a there's three batters. I say three. I know we mentioned four, but again, I just don't think Biggio will be in the lineup today. But Varsho, Bo, and Springer, that's three of your top four hitters, right? So it's going to have to be go time. It's going to have to be significantly better from those guys at the top of the Blue Jay lineup today if they want to get to Jordan Lyles and, and put up the sort of damage that they're capable of. Those four batters, by the way, those numbers I just rhymed off, that combines for a 143 batting average with 10 strikeouts. For our championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. Well, it's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay's guaranteed fit, you can be sure that the part you need fits right and the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check so that you know that part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop at eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Also want to mention that we are very close and we will soon know the results of the Built Bar March Madness contest. You know my vote was salted caramel. One locked on fan going to win a 12 month subscription to Built to have Built's best bars or puffs delivered monthly straight to their door. You got to try Built, the best protein bar ever. Seriously, so amazing, you won't even think they're good for you. Now, what does make Built Bars and Puffs so good? Well, for starters, high in protein, low in sugar, and covered in 100% real chocolate. Yes, that's right. Enjoy a Built Protein Bar or Puff today. Craig Ballard with you, Locked On Blue Jays. Of course, Locked On Blue Jays is part of the Locked On Podcast Network. So if you have a favorite team in a different sport as well, check out the Locked On That Team also. And if you're like me and you're a fantasy baseball fan, please do keep in mind that there is Locked On Fantasy Baseball for you to check out. Would always recommend you start your day with Locked On Blue Jays. Don't get me wrong, but the Locked On Network of Podcasts absolutely has got, it's got something else for you. That, that I'm sure of a lot of good content here on the Locked On Network. Now, middle segment today, going to take a look at, we, we got you set for the Jays. Uh, again, it's getaway day, so we got you set for the matinee in the first segment. Now, it is Thursday, so I thought we'd have a nice little throwback Thursday segment here, or, or throwback Thursday for the rest of, the, of today, where we deep dive some what I consider some interesting stats and some interesting cast and characters and stories in Toronto Blue Jay history. In the final segment, going to be joined by Scott and Adam from the Walk Off Podcast as they tell us their throwback Thursday moments. For today, considering that it is the seventh game of the season for the Toronto Blue Jays, I went with number seven as our number that will deep dive. So let's start with number seven. Seven is the franchise record for one player for hitting a home run in the most consecutive games. That was Kendrys Morales. You guys, you remember Kendrys Morales, the switch hitting slugger for the Toronto Blue Jays uh, in what was that, 17 and 18? Uh, 18 and 19, actually. And, and I was a, a Kendrys Morales fan. Now, uh, I liked it, and he, he, I was in the minority there, right? He was very underwhelming to a lot in the fan base, and it had nothing to do with, with Kendrys Morales, the, the player. He was a switch-hitting veteran you know, slugger. What, what wasn't to like? But really, at that time, I think the Blue Jay fan base was hoping for a, a little bit more bang for the old buck there, hoping for even bigger names, you know, bigger game hunting. They were hoping that Shapiro and Atkins uh, would do, but it, it ended up being Kendrys Morales, that tw uh, 2018 Blue Jay team, Oh boy, uh, not a good team that finished in fourth place. So really, the the Kendry and finished under five hundred. So really, the Kendry's Morales home run binge was the only thing to to get excited about and cheer for that season. I even remember the announcers. It was the only time even the announcers were having fun that season. Now, over those seven games, it happened in mid August. He actually in game two of that streak, he hit two home runs. So all told, in that home run binge that lasted one week, 
Kendrys would add eight home runs <laughs> over that week. I mean, absolute fire, extremely impressive. Now, as a side note here, let me mention, I say, so, so that's Kendrys with seven straight games with a home run. That's the Blue Jays record. The major league record for consecutive games with a home run is one more. That's eight. It's been set by, it's been accomplished by three different players in major league history. The first was way back in the day, Dale Long, I believe Pittsburgh Pirates back in 56. The most recent was the kid, Ken Griffey Jr. He did that with the Seattle Mariners back in 1993. And the middle happened in 1997, eight home runs, uh, sorry, eight straight games with a home run. New Toronto Blue Jay bench coach, Don Mattingly. Yeah, Donnie baseball, Donnie ball game. Put together that incredible streak. I think there was a grand slam or two in there for, for Mattingly's as well. Like just, just, just sensational. Remember, we, we've talked about Don Mattingly before. I told you he was an incredible hitter, uh, an incredible situational hitter who did have a, a power. He he could he he could hit it out as well, absolutely. And he was an RBI machine. He's he's really his approach at the plate is why I was so excited to have him added to this Blue Jay coaching staff. But yeah, so that's where we start with seven with Kendrys Morales with the home run record. How about another Blue Jay franchise record? Now, this is for one game. Blue Jays back in 1984 stole seven bases in one game. Lloyd Mosby got one. Willie Upshaw snagged a pair. And Dave Collins snagged four bases in that game. That was part of Dave Collins' 1984 season where he stole 60 bases for the Toronto Blue Jays, a, a, a franchise record that still stands to this day. There's been a couple Blue Jays that cracked the 50s. None have really come close to, to 60, though. And, and I'll ask you, do you think with the, because we, we have new base running rules in Major League Baseball now, right? L looking to promote action on the base pass. And the Blue Jays have brought in some speed. Whit Merrifield can, can run and steal bases. Dalton Varshow can run and steal bases, right? Kevin Kiermeyer can run and steal bases. So do you think any Blue Jay will approach 60? And, and you know what? Let's say this. Do you think any Blue Jay will get in the 40s? Drop me a comment and let me know. And I say the 40s because in the 2000s, the best season for a base stealer for the Toronto Blue Jays was 2012. That was Rajay Davis. He stole 46. Rajay Davis, right? Obscure Blue Jay reference there. But he stole 46 in, in uh, what was that, 2012. So let's start because I, I, I actually, even with the new rules and that, I actually don't think anyone will approach Dave Collins' 60. But could somebody get in the 40s for the Blue Jays? Also, let me know. I want to know this from you, considering the new rules. Do you think the Blue Jays' record of seven stolen bases in one game will be will be approached this season by this squad? I'm going to say that there's a few games this season where, as a team, the Blue Jays steal five bases. Let's see if they get up to six or seven. That does seem lofty to me, but I could see a, I could see a few games. There's going to be a, several games where where there's going to be a double steal in there. Witt and and Kiermaier at the, at the bottom of that lineup do a double steal. There's two on one pitch like right away, right? So I can see there's going to be a few games where the this season where the Jays are going to have five. Let's see if they get six or seven. We'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Now, the, the most interesting number seven <laughs> in Toronto Blue Jay history had to be Tony Batista. My goodness. I mean, the batting stance alone, right? The batting stance alone. We've talked in previous uh, Locked on Blue Jay episodes about how Tony Fernandez, for example, had an entire country mimicking his batting style too. That is true. But really mimicking that sidearm, that just how smooth he was defensively. An entire country mimicking Tony Fernandez. There was not an entire country mimicking Tony Batista. Like, where do you even start trying to mimic that batting style? It's the wonkiest, most insane. Of all the words you could use to describe Tony Batista's batting style, traditional is not going to be on that list. It, it, I think wonky is is probably the one that that sums it up the most. But man, there was a lot of times where he got results, right? So the Blue Jays acquired Tony Batista from the Arizona Diamondbacks. Uh, not halfway through, uh, I mean, maybe about a quarter of the way through the 1999 season. I believe he played just under 100 games for the Blue Jays that season. Now, he played as a Blue Jay shortstop and hit 26 home runs. Now, at that time, that's a new Blue Jay franchise record for most home runs by a shortstop. So, Tony Fernandez, uh, Tony Fernandez, Tony Batista walks in the door, sets a team record for home runs by shortstop. Okay, okay, you've got my attention, Tony. Consider me impressed. Very next season. So, now we're into the year 2000. We've survived Y2K. We're into the uh, 2000 season. Tony Batista's moved over to third base. He's a full-time third baseman now for the Toronto Blue Jays. He wallops 41 home runs. That is, a, at the time, is a franchise record for home runs by a third baseman. So Tony Batista walks in the door, sets the Blue Jays' record for franchise home runs by a shortstop, follows that up for an encore, setting the record for the Blue Jay record, the Blue Jay record for third baseman with a home run. <laughs> Impressive, my goodness. But. But here's where the story really, really shapes up here, in my opinion, anyway. The very next season, 2001, 
Jim Fergosi is out. Buck Martinez is in as manager. It did not take Tony Batista long to end up in Buck Martinez's doghouse. Uh, it, it seemed like they didn't get along personality wise, but certainly from a production standpoint, Tony Batista was really struggling. Came in like a house of fire, right? 99 and 2000 for the Blue Jays. 2001, really, really, really struggling. The, the, the Blue Jays were looking to send him down to AAA. Now, he was out of options, of course, so he'd have to go through waivers. So the Blue Jays were hoping to get strategic with this. Now, I want to take your mind's eye back to the landscape of baseball at that time. This is the year 2001. The Baltimore Orioles have Cal Ripken now move to third base, and they know this is the end of the line for Cal Ripken. They know they need to find a new third baseman in Baltimore. Rip, Rip, Ripken is done. <laughs> so Baltimore is actually in town for a four-game series against the Toronto Blue Jays at this time, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. On that Monday, the Blue Jays have decided, you know what? It's untenable with Tony Batista right now. He needs to go down to AAA. There's there's legitimate things he needs to work out with the swing. We, we need to work on him, work with him on some of these things. On a Monday night, after that game against Baltimore, Blue Jays tried to just sneak him through, sneak him through waivers, get him down to AAA so he can work on things. A Monday night waiver claim, trying to be sneaky. The Baltimore Orioles noticed it. Not only were they in town and noticed that Batista didn't play in that first game. So, hey, is something up here? But as I say, they're they're actively actively looking to see who they can get to replace Cal Ripken Jr. So the Baltimore Orioles snag Tony Batista on waivers. So on Monday, he's a Toronto Blue Jay as they play the Baltimore Orioles. On Tuesday, he's a Baltimore Oriole as they play the Toronto Blue Jays. So odd. Just takes a stuff, goes across the hole to, to the visitors now. He's now become a Baltimore Oriole. And it didn't take him long to acquaint himself with his new teammates either. That that first game, uh, he played in the Tuesday, that very first game. I think it was a, a 0 for 2, 0 for 3, a 1 for 3. It wasn't great that first game. But then that Wednesday game, so his second game as an Oreo, Tony Batista's against the Blue Jays, he goes 3 for 4 and hits a home run off Esteban Loaiza. So, oh, my God. And the Blue Jays are sitting there going, are you kidding? That's who we thought we had. That's who we thought we Where was that this year? So just incredible. It was Gordash was the GM of the Blue Jays at the time. He tried to get sneaky and get Tony Batista through to AAA. Uh-uh. It all blew up. It all blew up. Oh, my goodness. The, today we're deep diving the number seven and throwback Thursdays for the Toronto Blue Jays here on Locked On Blue Jays with your host, Craig Ballard. Oh, I don't know if you heard that. That was some big thunder. Hopefully that didn't. Uh, disturb you here and come through my mic, but it is a it is a stormy day in Toronto today. I'll tell you, not stormy Daniels, nothing like that. No, just weather wise, it's a tough one in Toronto today. If the Blue Jays were were playing in Toronto, this would be one of those days where your social media would be flooded with, oh my gosh, thank goodness we have a dome, right? That's it's one of those days in in the six today. Now we're deep diving the number seven in Toronto Blue Jay franchise history. Number seven is now th th this one's not a good record. There were seven Blue Jays in a row that were struck out in one game. That's the most Blue Jay, most consecutive Blue Jays struck out in a game. And that was back in 2001, and it was Hideo Nomo. Do you remember Hideo Nomo? Now, ironically, the Blue Jays used to they hit Nomo really well, but on this particular game, my goodness, this particular game, Hideo Nomo threw a complete game, one-hit shutout, did not walk a batter, struck out 14. Is that going to work? Is that going to work? And the rain pelting down right now. So again, hopefully sound-wise we're okay here. But yeah, I mean, wow, right? First of all, complete game. When do we ever see that anymore? And one hit, no walks, 14 strikeouts. My goodness. So the seven Blue Jays in a row. Top of the seven, sorry, top of the six, there's one man out. Hideo Nomo strikes out Homer Bush. Hideo Nomo strikes out Shannon Stewart to end that inning. There's two. Now we go to the top of the seventh. Alex Gonzalez leads off the inning, struck him out. Carlos Delgado's next, struck him out. Raul Mondesi's next, struck him out. And there's a couple sluggers in there, right? Delgado and Mondesi. Now we go to the top of the eighth inning. Nomo struck out five Blue Jays in a row. Brad Fulmer, strike three. There's six Blue Jays in a row. Jose Cruz Jr., who had a monster season uh, in 2001. I think he had like a 37 home run. He had a monster season in 2001. Not in this game. Strike three, you're out. Seven strikeouts in a row for Hideo Nomo. Wow, that remains uh, a Blue Jay record. And not a good one, right? Now, finally, let's get to got to be the craziest, one of the craziest stories in Toronto Blue Jay history. And it belongs to somebody who wore number seven, Damaso Garcia. Now, Damaso Garcia, if you're not familiar with him, as I say, wore number seven for the Toronto Blue Jays. He was a uh, one of the first stars that the Toronto Blue Jays ever had. Uh, he was, a uh, other than Dave, Dave, Dave Steve, of course, yes, but position player-wise, really, Damaso Garcia was the first Blue Jay that was on the map as a, a as a really great positional player. He was actually an all-star in 1984, 1985. Our story takes place the following year, 1986. Now, need to set the scene for you here. 
So we're in mid-May of 1986. The Toronto Blue Jays are in last place, and Domaso Garcia is scuffling. He's really struggling. So on the surface right away, we can see, oh, a last place team and the player's struggling. Okay, we can see why the player's frustrated. How about for context, though, we, you need to look at the entire thing. Remember, this is on the heels of the, of the drive for 85. 1985, we've talked about this disaster before. when It was the first year ever in, in baseball history where the American League Championship Series went from a best of five to a best of seven. Blue Jays, it was the first time ever that the Blue Jays made the playoffs was 1985. They go up three games to one in the Kansas City Royals. So in any other season in baseball history, the Blue Jays would have been in the World Series. And I've said before, and, and I get, I could just be accused of having my Blue Jay fan hat on here, but I really think they were going to beat St. Louis in that World Series. So all kinds of pain and, and heartache as the Blue Jays would lose games five, six, and seven. So they would lose four games to three to Kansas City. So that's where the 1986 season takes us on the heels of not just frustrating out of the playoffs, but historically frustrating exit from the playoffs. Because again, first time ever that that three to one series lead in the ALCS wasn't good enough. So that's the level of frustration on this Blue Jay team at this point. Damaso Garcia, all-star in 84, all-star in 85, struggling in 86. So he is going absolutely nuts. What have we seen from, uh, from players before when they go absolutely nuts? Have we seen anything like this? Uh, what was it? Uh, I want to say May 14th. It was mid-May 1986. Uh, it's a three-all game, three-all tie. Uh, they're playing a Baltimore uh, late in the game. I believe it was Baltimore. Anyway, I remember late in the game, Adamson Garcia makes an error, uh, a bad error, like, uh, like on a routine ground ball too. That opens the floodgates. The other team would score six runs. So now it's a ninth. Instead of three-all late in the game, it's a 9-3 beatdown. It's yet another loss for the extremely frustrated Toronto Blue Jays. Adamson was key in this loss. Goes into the dugout. So he's really struggling right now. What have we seen players do when they're struggling before all the superstitious stuff? Even if even if there's, you know, some sort of taking it out physically on something, it's usually like George Bell at this time reportedly, for example, uh, took a bat and destroyed a, a clubhouse chair. Like that, that's more traditionally, right? What we see of players getting out their frustrations and trying to turn things around is, you know, wailing on some sort of inanimate object, right? In the dugout. We've seen that before. Have we seen this before from Damaso Garcia? He goes into the, uh, it, the, there were the visitors. He goes into the visitors uh, clubhouse, goes into the shower, takes his uniform, takes his hat, douses it with alcohol, sets them on fire. <laughs> Pardon me. Yeah. Sets them on fire. Have you ever seen or since seen a player deal with a slump like this? Oh my goodness. Like just absolutely insane. Of course, this is 1986, right? So there's no social media, but this was still a story that that's no pun intended that spread like wildfire because of how just absolutely insanely odd it was. Now, Domo got in a lot of trouble for that, right? The, uh, uh, Jimmy Williams was the manager at that time, not happy. Blue Jays were not happy. They, they really viewed it as, you know, sort of desecrating the colors, Right. You could see why the Blue Jays would, would be upset with something like that. Now, side note, and, and I mean, hilariously, it worked. Now, it didn't work for the Blue Jays. I think the Blue Jays finished fourth that season. It worked for the Blue Jays. They, they, they continued to have a bad year, but it did work for Domso Garcia, right? The, the very next game, he would start a hitting streak. O over the next month, month and a half, he was absolute fire. And for the rest of the season, all told, he'd hit 300. <laughs> want to take a quick moment here to let you know we're proud to have So Rare as a new sponsor. Now, So Rare is a revolutionary fantasy baseball game and marketplace transforming fans into owners with officially licensed digital cards featuring players from across all 30 MLB teams. So Rare MLB game weeks happen twice weekly and span a three to four day cycle. At the end of the games of the game weeks, So Rare MLB managers who rank at or near the top of their leaderboards win a variety of rewards, which can include So Rare scarcity cards, game tickets, merchandise, signed jerseys, and VIP experiences like meeting MLB stars. Prizes may depend on the competition. Now head to SoRare.com slash locked on, that's spelled S-O-R-A-R-E dot com, to draft your team of free player cards, set your lineup, and start competing today to win epic rewards. Again, that's SoRare.com slash locked on, start playing today. 
So Craig Ballard locked on Blue Jays with Scott Belfort and Adam Mack of the Walk Off Podcast. And I've invited these gentlemen back on for a segment here because it is Thursday. So I thought, let's do a throwback Thursday segment. And I don't know, none of us know what we're going to talk about here, but the assignment was just any random, you know, throwback moment in Toronto Blue Jay history. Let's get into Scott's mind. What are some of his memories? Let's get into Adam's mind. What are some of his memories? But my guess is 91, 92, somewhere in there. So I was a huge Kelly Gruber fan. Huh. And one of the one of the things I loved about Kelly Gruber is that he was a hustler. He was always giving her. The moment that stood out to me, and again, I wish I knew the exact moment, and you, Craig, might even be able to pinpoint it for me, but I remember him sliding into third base, and then he 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 scabbed up yeah. his chin, right? He got that cut on his chin, and just like as an eight-year-old boy, I was just like, this guy like wow look at it look at the hustle on him right so that stands out to me as an obscure blue jays moment that for whatever reason just stuck with me throughout my life now scott don't get upset with me when i ask a follow-up here because you said gruber's your guy gruber was the first blue jay to hit for the cycle now he turned that that last hit and this last at bat for the cycle he needed a single he turned that double into a single. It wasn't as bad as Jeff Fry. Jeff Fry yeah. had waste it to the wall in right center. And and now, do you remember Scott? The weirdest thing when Jeff Fry was rounding first, somebody from the first base dugout, which is the visitors' dugout, was yelling at him to stop. I don't know if you remember this. So he did stop and come back. And that person came out of the dugout and came and celebrated with him. It was Kelly Gruber. So odd. Kelly Gruber happened to be at the game. I think they're playing Texas. He was a guest of the Rangers. Something like that. But what, yeah. you, what are your thoughts, Scott, on Gruber's cycle? Is there an asterisk there? Or no, Craig, that was legit. I mean, there's probably an asterisk there, yeah. but I think it I, it counts. It, it does. It, it's in the record it books. It, it is in the record books. Like it, I mean, I feel the same way about Jeff Fry's hit for the cycle. Like, yeah, there probably should be an asterisk, but it's in yeah. the books. It is what it is. How about we put it this way? At the very least, the most impressive cycle then was Biggio's because he needed a triple in his last at bat and he got. We'll agree there, I guess. Yeah, that okay. that's the most legit cycle in Blue Yeah, Day it's history, bold to hit sure. an in, inside the park home run and then hold up at third so you can pull off the, the triple. <laughs> Adam Mack, even even poo pooing Bishios. Oh my goodness! <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh my gosh. Okay. No. Well, then Adam, we need a Blue Jay to step up and hit a legit cycle this year for all of us to be happy. Then yes. How about that for the plan? Dalton and by Varsho. the way, but yeah, well, Varsho. Varsho. I'm, I'm, but uh, well, I'm realizing as I say that that the hit for the cycle you'll have to hit a home run. And how's that gone so far for the Blue? Okay, let's move on. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> Adam Mack, over to you. What is your throwback obscure Blue Jay memory? Okay, uh, mine goes back to the Reed Johnson, Frank Catalanato, oh. early 2000 era as well. So this was, I would have been in like my early high school days uh, watching every game all summer long with my best buds. Eric Hinsky, Rookie of the Year, mm, right? Yeah. You had Orlando Hudson, you had Halliday. I mean, you weren't winning a single game all year long, but you tuned in anyways. Um, I remember... This, this is a deep cut here. Uh, do you remember Gustavo Chassin? Oh, wow. Absolutely. His, he, he, <laughs> the, the, the cologne. He had his cologne, his own cologne. The cologne. This is my yeah. obscure thing. Okay, is, okay. I don't know where this <laughs> okay. is, but we pitched our funds together. eBay was, I mean, something I'd never heard of until then. But uh, You are not about to tell me that you was, wore that cologne. Oh, my God. No. Well, I, ne okay. I never like wore okay. it, but we did buy a bottle of it. We chipped all our funds in, and we bought a bottle of it off of eBay. I don't think it ever arrived, to be honest. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> now, so now, 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 now I'm saying this cologne story cologne out loud. Yeah. What? So, yeah. so we've uncovered that that was actually a scam. Adamac breaking news <laughs> on the Lockdown <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> or my oh. buddies ripped me off, and they were just they just told oh, me wow. it never arrived and put it in their back cupboard. But, uh, well, yeah. even in now, high school, you were the big man on cologne. Well, they were jealous there of you, Adam. Even in high school, you were surely the big man on <laughs> campus. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Remember Gustavo Chassin had, had, had the goggles every time out, right? Uh, mm -hmm. A lefty on there. Absolutely. Uh, gentlemen, really thank you. Really appreciate your time. Now, we'll get you out of here. I know it's Thursday. We had you on the show on, on Tuesday and, and a little bit on Wednesday as well. So I really appreciate that. But still, even with that said, Anytime. still want you guys to let the good people know for the five or six that, that aren't familiar with the walk-off podcast, how can they get familiar with the walk-off podcast? 
You can follow us uh, on Twitter at Walk Off Podcast, Instagram, the Walk Off Podcast. You can find the podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. I said podcast way too many times there. Uh, and we also have a video element on YouTube. We've got the clip channel as well. And a quick reminder, Scott, because today is Thursday. I do believe that the Walk Off Podcast is dropping an interview they're very excited about with a Blue Jay prospect. So tell us a little bit about that. Where, where, where can we, we check that out? And who is it with? So last month we sat down with Naswal Polino and his translator, which is the first time that us on the walk off have ever chatted with a, a Spanish mm -hmm. player who is going through a translator. So that was a really interesting experience. The kid is just so fun to talk to and just has such a great story. And on top of it, uh, has a lot of potential. He's he's pitching with the Dunedin Blue Jays this year, but surely on the rise. That'll do it for this Thursday episode of Locked on Blue Jays. Certainly thank you for spending part of your day with me talking Blue Jay baseball. Be sure to stick around on the Locked on Network and check out an episode of Locked on Fantasy Baseball. And as for tomorrow's show on Friday, we'll deep dive the weekend series as the Toronto Blue Jays head into Anaheim to take on Mike Trout and Shohei Otani.